and welcome to episode number one of Understanding the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's Crypto Industry Principles. My name is Ron Quaranta. I'm privileged to serve as chair of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, and we've got some guests that are joining us, members of the WSBA, uh, that will be speaking to the industry principles we've put forward, uh, as well as speaking to where we see the benefit and why that uh, will be an evolving series of principles for the industry. Uh, this is an open public forum. If you're watching us on LinkedIn Live, please do share with your colleagues. Uh, happy to discuss and answer questions as well. One disclaimer real quickly, uh, please obviously keep in mind uh, that this is not meant to be accounting, investment, legal, or tax advice. Uh, and I want to stop for a moment and give all of our colleagues a uh, part of the core team that created uh, the WSBA Crypto Industry Principles. David, please say hello. Please introduce yourself to the audience. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Wysocki. I've been an attorney for nearly 40 years working in TradFi, banks, broker dealers, hedge funds, VCs, mostly on the transactional side with a heavy dose of regulatory overlay uh, aspects um, uh, involved, technology, data analytics, as well as, of course, uh, blockchain deployment. Pleasure to meet everybody. Good to see you, old friend. Sonia, you and I go back a ways. Please say hello. <laughs> Yes, we go back a long way. Um, I'm Sonia Gokhilani. Uh, run a you know run a small startup called ClearTrack. So basically, grew up in the in the hedge fund space and prime broker space and Goldman uh, Deutsche Bank, and uh, now you know playing in the blockchain space. And thanks to Ron, we are actually working together on the Wall Street. Yeah, on the Wall Street. Uh, uh, working. What happened? We we got you. You're still good. So I was confused in, in terms of something happened. Uh, so we worked together in terms of running the enterprise working group. Uh, for uh, And then I sit on a couple of startup boards and working with the Indian government on CBDC and uh, in, in also with the um, Dubai government and Abu Dhabi government. So looking forward to partnering with all of you and seeing how we can adopt these principles going forward. Sonia, thanks so much. I think we're finally getting Jess, another one of the members okay. of the WSBA. Jess, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. Say hello to the audience, please. Hello, everyone. Who are you? Who do you work for? Jess Stumacher. I'm counsel at, um, at Zuber Lawler, um, and I focus on the digital asset space. So welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I want to kick this conversation off. And David, with your permission, I'd like to do that with you. And again, keeping in mind this audience on LinkedIn Live. And again, thank you all for joining us. Um, is meant to be WSBA members and beyond across the entirety of the industry. David, oh, matter of fact, all four of us, we've kind of seen the ups and downs of uh, the crypto industry. We've seen the ups and downs of multiple crypto winters. We've seen the evolution of blockchain technology. Uh, and then 2022 hit, David, and it was an entirely new dynamic, at least from what I've seen. We saw the collapse of FTX. We've seen the collapse of other, and the bankruptcy of other firms. Why, we, so we, we really sat down to understand the industry needs a series of principles. David, let's start off. Why did we get together to create these principles? What were your perspectives at sure. the time? And then we can have the others weigh in as well. Sure. You know, uh, thank you, Ron. Um, you know, the, the industry was going through its normal up and down cycle. And this time a year ago, it felt like everything was ending, right? You had, um, you know, crypto winter became in full bloom about a year ago. Terra Luna came crashing down to terra firma. Yeah. As you mentioned, FTX had blown up uh, and it did so in such a spectacular way. Uh, that you began, we all began to wonder whether or not the industry's aspirations were going to go down with it. Regulators were in an awkward position. Some had sat on the sidelines too long. Others had cozied up to the industry and maybe felt um, uh, sideswiped uh, by some of the bad actors that uh, were now coming to the fore. Um, and so what we're looking at, and, and yet the resiliency of the technology, the resiliency of the application and the deployment uh, continued, um, sometimes silently, sometimes quietly, and it expanded from uh, pure retail to a more institutional footprint. There were a lot of traditional firms that were getting to build in the, in the space. And as an organization, we kind of looked at the landscape and we felt that we just really needed to build some basics. We call them best practices rather than codes or rules. We're not regulators. We're not trying to be a self-regulatory authority. We'll leave that to, to others. But we felt we needed to raise a hand um, in support of, of builders, developers, investors who 
believed that the technology was legitimate and the activity was legitimate. We needed to remove the taint of fraud from some of the uh, participants. And if regulation was going to take some time, if things were going to be stymied for longer, we just needed to help coalesce the industry around core values, uh, many involving just good governance, things that shouldn't be controversial, but were not necessarily uh, always deployed. Yeah. And we just simply needed to find a way to avoid replicating the worst of aspects of TradFi. Um, front running, commingling, false trading, false valuations, all of the things that you know, the regulated financial community has spent 90 years, for the most part, solving. Could it be better? Sure. But for the most part, there's a highly liquid uh, uh, financial community in TradFi, and we didn't want to replicate the bad acts that had been bled out of the traditional system. So the principles are the SBA, WSBA's way of helping bringing about uh, a, a solid footprint to tell regulators, congressional leaders, uh, that crypto can play in the real world and it can be regulated in the real world. And until there's a dead, until the deadlock breaks, we will work with people with uh, good heart, good mind, uh, to self-police their conduct so that we uh, cabin, reduce, and remove the bad actors and the bad actions in the industry. David, thanks so much. Sonia, I want to go to you, and, and I think, David, to allude, you know, expand upon David's point a little bit, one of the things we very much focused on in the principles, you know, Sonia, you and I have been through pre-Dodd-Frank, post-Dodd-Frank, we've seen this kind of evolution of, of, of markets. And as markets build, operating with a series of principles that make sense, and in many regards, mirror TradFi, in my mind, was very, very important. Um, what have you seen from the development of crypto and blockchain, and, and where do you fit in, when your thoughts fit in, as far as, uh, as the principles themselves? How closely do they mirror what we've seen before? Very similar, I would say. And um, we, I mean, coming from the Dodd-Frank area, I pretty much saw, uh, you know, the different banks and you know different the mortgage crisis I actually was there uh you know with the regulators working at that time and so I've seen the similar kind of typically you know any new asset class that comes in goes through a life cycle and I think this it's it is crypto is a derivative in some ways because it's going through the same life cycle issues in terms of you know margin you know how do you manage the margin how do you do the KYC checks you know how do you do the custody you had a problem with the custody how do you make Staking was very similar to a derivative contract or an index or whatever, right? In some ways, you're actually getting value out of the underlier, essentially. So I kind of see a lot of similarities in that aspect. In the, if I draw a parallel to both the areas, and in, in terms of the reporting requirements, I mean, you had, you know, major reporting requirements were not met with, you know, in the past. And then you had SDR and you did that. Now you don't have reporting requirements. And this, I think this is a more, even more complex asset class compared to derivatives, because derivatives essentially was mainly in, or, you know, focused on the institutional side, not as much a retail side. And I was actually talking to David earlier about this. This becomes even more complex for us to lay down the foundation, you know, in a much more robust way so we can build up, because this is an industry that's going to grow and you're going to have other assets that are going to be digitized. Like, you know, I was mentioning earlier that this is going to be like, you know, coming, talking as an, you know, an architectural perspective, you have this as a foundation, you have the basement, which would probably be the custody of the assets. And then you have different floors that would come in, essentially, you have the NFTs come in, you have real estate tokenization coming in. So kind of looking at very similar, like you have a typical, you know, in a derivative contract, you have a typical underlier, then you have CDSs or interest rate swaps, or depending on the underlier, you have different complex swaps that come in, right? They kind of look at it the same way and, you know, and, you know, in terms of, you know, you have this whole building that's going to be eventually built and it's a long road ahead. It's a very dynamic, but the, the bigger challenge you have now, it's a more dynamic environment. And, mm -hmm. and one thing that's different out here is social media. It wasn't there back in those days influencing any asset class. Today, if you're on Clubhouse or Insta or any other Reddit platform, it could actually make or break a market or break, you know, you could buy into a token or you know, sell a token. So that is the part, it's even more important that you build a strong foundation that you can, and a very agile foundation, which can adapt to the new uh, changes that come in the market in terms of what could be tokenized, whether it's loyalty rewards, like I 
I'm a, I'm a board member at Points Cash, where when we started out building out Points Cash, it was like we were just going to, you know, use the points as, you know, as collateral. But now there are so many different ways of monetizing it. Yeah. Build partnerships with so many, uh, you know, uh, airline partners or with hotel partners, and they're actually putting it on the balance sheet as an asset, right. you know. So that is something, you know, and then how this is going to eventually, you know, transform to the end, wearing my technology hat here. Uh, it's it's so important to lay down this foundation because you will not be able to get, you know, you won't be able to get new other asset classes going forward if you don't do that. You know, it will be very difficult to build up yeah. those asset classes. Sonia, it's funny. I, I, I'm old enough to remember you just said something that was really interesting to me. You said, you know, derivatives are simple compared to I remember the days where people were like, oh, my God, derivatives are so complex. And now we're looking back and saying, no, that was that was pretty easy. Now we got crypto. Um, just I want to pull you in. I want to pull you into the conversation um, before I do that real quickly. For those of you in the audience, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, please do submit questions in the chat. We'll be able to read them here and address them throughout. Uh, and anyone interested in the copy of the principles that are publicly available, go to the WSBA website wsba.co, you'll see the, the big link to the entirety of the principles. Just, I wanted to pull you into the conversation. One of the discussions we've been having for a long time within the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance obviously consists of lawyers and the regulatory aspects of it. And so I think and you all contributed segments to the WSBA principles. What have you seen as far as, you know, was it the Wild West? And I think in many regards it was. And why would principles be useful in the context of law and regulation? What are your thoughts about it? Well, I think there's no disagreement that there's sort of, you know, this huge gap in, of law and regulations in the space and sort of, you know, I, I, you know, uh, market participants, you know, operating in the space without sort of, you know, the, these rule sets or standards. Um, you know, there, there is this, you know, gap to allow in bad actors. And I think, you know, adhering or voluntarily opting in and having sort of, you know, the option of telling the industry, you know, this is what the, the rest of the industry deems appropriate and, and deems um, standard sort of, you know, to live by or to, to aspire, I guess, to meet. Um, I think that sort of, you know, in a way disincentivizes um, some of the, some of the bad actors and, and also, you know, sort of brings to light the good actors and sort of, you know, I think it's, it's important, especially where we have this gap in laws because there's no one sort of, you know, telling them what not to do and sort of everyone is surprised when we have regulators coming in saying, you know, applying old rules um, in, in new ways and coming in and saying, you know, you, you were, you know, you did something wrong and, and, you know, the good actors aren't always, you know, uh, evil, I guess, by intent and, and mm. sort of, you know, good actors are often, you know, penalized in the system. So. Jess, thanks so much. I, I no, it's a good point. And David, I want to come back to you. One, and, and we created the crypto industry principles, 10 segments, everything from the generalized principles to Jess, you did a lot of work on customer rights. And we're going to come to that a bit later on down to disclosures and conflicts. One of the things that was very important to me and almost a kind of part of the passion work here is that there was this overarching dialogue in Washington. There was this overarching dialogue in a good chunk of the media that it's all bad. It's all illicit. Everyone's a crypto anarchist looking to burn down the Fed. Um, and what <laughs> we've seen, the four of us in the past you know, eight years now that the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance has been here is that that's not the case at all. And that we're beginning to see the, the evolution of TradFi and crypto coming together. David, do you agree with that perspective? And do you see crypto industry principles as a way of mitigating that really negative perspective on all of this? Sure. Um, it, no, no doubt the, the rest of the world catches up with the technology when it does something that's quicker, cheaper, better than what you're currently using. And so one of the you know, deployments that we've noticed uh, accelerating the last, uh, last year or so uh, last two years, it is blockchain deployment as opposed to crypto deployment, mm -hmm. more application as opposed to trading. And so you see the adoption of blockchain technology as a way to streamline and synthesize the payment system so that you have instantaneous payments on a global 24-7 uh, basis. You have... Um, uh, artists, uh, both music and visual artists, using the technology through NFTs to deploy uh, their creative 
work without the intermediation of a third party agency owner or uh, promoter, uh, keeping the value to them. Um, you see it being applied in real estate. You see it being applied um, in uh, commercial ventures in tracking and shipping. Uh, so it, it's abundantly clear that the technology is nimble and will be deployed. The various, uh, and obviously in different industries, it's going to meet and have to adopt to various um, regulatory requirements in, the, in that industry. But fundamentally, they still need to adopt and, and adhere to just good practices. I don't think there is anything unique about a financial sector as opposed to a commercial sector uh, where, you know, acting in good faith in keeping your customers' funds sacred and sacrosanct. Don't commingle. Don't use them. Don't front run. Make sure that the valuation that, and the deployment, the, the things that you promise are things that you deliver. Those things will adopt and evolve over time. They will vary from industry to industry as we go across the, the blockchain deployment. Uh, but fundamentally, the principles uh, are, a, a, as the name says, fundamental. Uh, the concepts remain, their deployment and application to different industry segments may vary. And we don't expect to see individuals in an in a industry sec segment everybody doing the same thing. That, that would be ridiculous. It's too new. It's too novel. There's going to be multiple ways to solve a problem, not just one way. And we don't envision the principles as being a top-down, we're going to tell you how to behave kind of conduct. We're just giving you a goal to shoot for. How you apply and comply is up to you. Yep. David, thanks so much. And and as you were bringing up those different industry verticals, I can feel Sonia wanting to talk about metaverse, <laughs> which I'm sure I'm sure we're going to get to a bit later. Sonia, just I, I, you know, let's pivot to both of you. And David alluded to this because the first section of the WSBA crypto industry principles and what we're calling release 1.0 is literally general principles. And I think the importance of that is manifested in the many planning meetings which we have we've had, which is it's regulator agnostic, it's platform agnostic, it's, it's, it's um, venue agnostic. It's literally meant to be a center of fundamental principles that industry participants in any of their forms can adhere to. Sonia, just why did, you, why did we think that was important? And what can we add to that as why, is the, why are those general principles the critical beginning of it all? Yes, you want to take it or should I? Go ahead. Okay. So I, I think the reason it's important, uh, you know, this, to create this kind of a framework, is 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 because um, you know you have, like I said earlier, you have an institutional play here and you have a retail play out here, and you have like multitude industries that would come in. Like for example, you have the real estate market, which is actually tokenizing assets, tokenizing their real estate properties. Now, if we don't set this kind of a, you know tone in the industry, there could be more failures. There could be more you know, this SVB is coming in, the more F FTX is coming in. So I think it's important to educate people, educate the industry, whether it's, you know, uh, even if, for example, even AI is going to come in, right? I mean, there, there are already, you know, companies that are coming up with AI applications for in terms of how to value these assets, how to, you know, to search for different kind of uh, hedging uh, options, I mean, hedging across multiple, uh, you know, platforms. So if, if the education is not there, if the institutions level foundation is not there, the industry could crash. And the the other reason would be is because this is a global phenomena. It's not, you know, only an institutional phenomena or only, you know, the UK market or the US market, which is traditionally what the the, the other, you know, complex asset classes. Uh, you know, like I, I like I told you, I work with the Indian government and I work with uh, the uh, UAE government. And they are playing big in this space. I mean, they're looking to tokenize, um, you know, a lot of their properties out there, a lot of their their oil rigs in terms of uh, they're looking to tokenize their diamond assets in some of the African countries. So if we don't set, you know, if we don't set this tone, we US being the leader, we are a global player in, in, in this. If we don't set the tone, I mean, it's going to really result in a crash in some way or the other at some other level. I mean, obviously, our reach is, our footprint is probably the U.S. at the moment. But, I mean, I look at the audience and, you know, I look at other people to come back and tell us, how do we, you know, 
make this a global footprint? So that's the other question I had on the table for the users. And, and, you know, and that's, a, that's a question on my mind too. I mean, I don't think I have the answer to the question, yeah. but we're making a beginning somewhere, I would say. Yeah. So Jess, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, and I definitely agree with um, what Sonia said. Um, I just want to add, I guess, that it's not just really customers. I mean, in an ideal world, I, I hope that this would be educating regulators alike. Um, you know, I think that, you know, it'd be great if they were even, you know, participants in the conversation. But I think that, you know, this is not just, you know, for every market participant or every and regulators, ideally, to really learn and understand this space. Jess, that's a really good point. Thank you for that. And, and as we mentioned, this is release 1.0. In subsequent weeks, we'll begin working on release 2.0, which will be a more granular approach, and then release 3.0, which will involve some level of engagement directly with institutions. We'll be having this conversation with regulators and legislators. As you know, we're not lobbyists, but certainly having that conversation to educate them about the fact that industry participants are actually working on doing the right thing and helping to have evolve this this ecosystem. David, I wanted to pivot back to you on one thing, and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I spent some time over the July 4th uh, holiday, much to my family's chagrin, rereading the entirety of our crypto industry principles. And we talked about general principles, and it, this something, alludes to something all three of you said. Some of the general core principles, the first things we put forward were segregate customer assets, pr uh, enforce prudent AML KYC, how do we answer some parts of the industry that say, well, that's a betrayal of this decentralized nature of what crypto is meant to be and blockchain is meant to be, when clearly we don't think, we don't necessarily agree with that. What are your thoughts about that, David? Yeah, no, I, look, I, th I think if you go to the polar extremes, if you want to be the purest crypto bro and say, you can't regulate me because I'm sui generis, I'm unique, I'm onto myself, you know, I think we've seen where that leads. Uh, you're not going to, have much take up, you're not going to have much following, and you're not going to uh, find subsequent investments. If you go to the other side and say that, you know, it's all fraud and, you know, ban it, damn it, uh, likewise, you know, you're not going to find a following for that approach, although, you know, both of those extremes still exist. We recognize the value of new technology and deployment. I think good regulators do likewise. I think good builders do, and s certainly investors. And I think the notion is, is that we just need to give people a, a legitimate framework, get us away from the two polar extremes where I could do whatever I want and you should not do any of it. It's banned. Neither of those are, are viable. Uh, and I think that you know, what we tried to do, if you look at our principles, we really, you know, I remember in, in some of our discussions, we even, I think you, you, you chided me for once even using the phrase, you know, just call it the Ten Commandments, <laughs> right? It's ch cheap bullet points, you know, thou shalt not do X. And, and, and that's wrong. It would be too cheeky um, um, and, and too simplified a landscape, right? Uh, it would be almost absurd to try to build things down to, uh, something as simple as that. But at the, on the other side, we, we didn't want to produce a document that was overly lawyerly and, you know, read like a law firm memo, which, you know, no one in their right mind would, would want to read unless they had to. And so we wanted to avoid the worst of those extremes, simplicity to the point of absurdity and an overly legalistic lawyerly document that lawyers would read, but no one would ever look at again. So we produce it and it just uh, sits there. And so we tended to skew to the middle. You know, I think that um, we dis discussed the kinds of issues and topics that we needed to address, regard agnostic to location, agnostic to, to industry. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we came up with discrete, bite-sized bullet points of information that allow individuals to adhere to a kind of conduct that evinces good faith. And I think that's where we ended up. David, thanks so much. I just, for the audience's sake, we talk about the crypto industry principles. Again, please take a look uh, on the WSBA website. Ten overarching sections, general principles, customer rights, collateral management, cybersecurity, custody segregation, solvency, on and on and on. One of the first of those segments as we move beyond uh, the general principles that we just mentioned. And Jess, I wanted to pull you into this if I could. Um, and I was surprised how little conversation there was in the industry, but you were really focused on customer rights. 
And you've been deeply involved in crypto in, in all of its iterations for some time. So you had a particularly unique perspective on customer rights. And I would argue that was an important first step in outlining the principles. Why did you think customer rights were so important? And what did you see in the industry that said to you, look, we have to address customer rights as part of these principles? Um, thanks, Ron. Um, undoubtedly, you know, I think, you know, as, as you know, everyone here mentioned that that's, this was really prompted, I guess, by the collapse of FTX and ensuing mm -hmm. collapse of really of other entities um, with exposure to FTX and sort of, you know, really who got, you know, it's it's one of the largest bankruptcies in terms of customers affected. Um, I think, you know, really it's it's you know, it's an individual trader, um, really, who, brought, who probably got hit the hardest in this. Um, and, you know, they don't necessarily know their rights. You know, you look at sort of, you know, the other Celsius bankruptcies, um, you know, it's other other sort of bankruptcies that we're seeing in the space play out and sort of that many customers didn't really understand um, their rights, didn't really have clear disclosures, um, lots of um, exchanges, platforms, they use sort of, you know, click, um, click, um, terms, uh, click, uh, click ter terms, terms, uh, policies and terms, uh, um, policies and procedures <laughs> um, every time they were updated. And, you know, it, it wasn't really clear. There was no way for, you know, customers to drill down on sort of the important things where you sort of have, you know, UDAP protection and in, in um, traditional lending, um, unfair deceptive acts and, and abuse and practices act um, in where sort of, you know, when you're, when you're getting a home or when you're getting, you know, any other type of loan, you have the, then sort of broken down really clearly for sort of the average consumer who doesn't understand legalese. And I think that here and in across the industry, you know, we, we sort of saw that play out and we're seeing it right now. And as it plays out in, over various issues in the bankruptcy courts, um, I think it's just really important that, you know, anyone who's dealing with customers and, and not necessarily just retail, um, you know, we, we saw hedge funds go under in the space, pretty large hedge, hedge funds. Um, but, you know, I think that it's really important that it's sort of, you know, customer rates are spelled out, they're delineated in, in, in sort of a, a very basic fashion and, and without, um, you know, the extra verbiose um, language. And, you know, that customers really understand their rights. I think yep. that that's sort of the most important point. Jess, thanks so much. Sonia, I want to I pivot to you a little bit. And I want to stay on customer rights for a moment, just given the work that you've done. Um, and one of the things we've looked at uh, when we talked about WSBA crypto industry principles was something to hold a mirror against at some point in the future. And what I mean by that is, you know, just you alluded to very complicated terms and conditions that most people don't read. And in fairness, most people probably don't read the terms of conditions for a standard options trading contract or, you know, their, their account at Vanguard or Fidelity, what, what have you. But the ability to look at a series of principles and, and kind of hold that mirror up to the providers in this space, in my mind, is, is hopefully one of the important evolutions of the crypto industry principles. Sonia, you've been in the depths of some of these really important things like KYC and AML in the different markets. Do you think that's a logical progression? Do you think the industry should be able to look at the crypto industry principles and again, use it as a mirror with whomever they're doing business with. Is that a possible evolution that we're looking at in your mind? I think so. I mean, I think it's, I mean, to allude to even David's point where we try to make it simple for people, right? I think that's a very important point uh, in this whole premise of it, because as we all know, the fine print that's written, even when you actually sign up on an Apple document or any document you sign up, nobody reads the fine print, right? So I think this, the fact that we've tried to make it very simple, and, and not put the jargon in. And I think all of us have put a lot of, there have been real great minds that have come together, like, you know, Dina and I, the others who've actually tried to make it. So somebody who's in the retail market also could understand it, or somebody who's, you know, even at a, an operational level can understand it. I think that is the key, that foundation, that that is important in our document, which will help. The, the other thing is, you know, Silicon Valley Bank crashing. I think one of the, reasons uh, reasons is uh, i would say technology is to blame in that situation though so i would the reason i would say that uh, is because when you know companies like silicon valley bank are operated in in areas in california and they they kind of don't work with the wall street providers they don't work with you know the east and the west i mean you know they just they just don't work together hmm. and your know, technology is is an enabler but sometimes Technology gets ahead of, you know, the actual business problem you're trying to solve, an actual, 
you know, you could actually put in the controls, but you need to understand what the actual, what could be the fraud that the, the client could do. For example, you know, being from the hedge fund industry, I've seen, you know, the, the, some of the KYC checks we used to do at Deutsche Bank and, you know, these funds would be based in Cayman Islands and they would, when we would do a check on them, they wouldn't even be existing, you know, and, and only because the bank had a, you know, a robust infrastructure to check for it, it was fine. But the newer participants in this market don't have that. Mm. And how do you make sure that you can check? But you have social media today, you have different, you know, uh, like when I do KYC, I mean, I put some of my, uh, you know, employees that I board on board also, I actually do a whole search on them. So there are a lot of, you know, so social media tools available out there where you can actually do these kind of checks. So you can keep it simple too. And I think our, our you know, to your point about our principles, it could help people that you need to take care of this aspect mm. and you need to look at different mediums to actually take care of it. So that's what we're mm. trying to tell people. It is simple, guys. You don't have to be a bank or you, you could be a small firm as well, but you have to do the process. Yeah. So that's what we could stress on. Yeah, Sonia, that's a good point. I appreciate it. Um, David, I want to pivot to you a little. And we're still, you know, when we look at customer rights, Jess, when you originally drafted this, it re some of these bullet points really hit home. Committing to providing full, fair, and transparent terms. And it goes on and on and on about kind of peeling back the layers. And we'll describe these and discuss these in future episodes and sessions. But David, Jess, uh, David and Jess, I wanted to ask, you know, it's interesting when we begin to look at the evolution now of TradFi within the space. And it's been something we've been talking about for a long, long time. But, you know, these are things that traditional financial services firms, if we're just looking on the finance side of it all, are used to doing. Does that explain, David, in your opinion, why we're now seeing the Black Rocks of the world move forward with spot Bitcoin ETFs? And look, these, these are companies that make these decisions after careful deliberation over time to see if there's an economic value there. But they're also used to being regulated. What do we make of that kind of evolution? And where do the principles fit in? Really interesting question. You know, I, I have a more... It wasn't in prep, by the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I have a more jaundiced view instead, you know... Um, you know, banks in traditional finance have a ha, have a unique skill set, and that is to come in at the right time. And I think that part of what we're seeing here is, you know, I don't I don't want to say it's bottom fishing. I don't want to say that they're buying in or coming into a segment at its low point, but the you know, economically that seems to be where where we are. They're also looking at um, a a footprint. A, an upswelling of regulatory certainty in other jurisdictions and a sense of how they can help spearhead some financial regulatory certainty within a space that has lacked uh, clarity of conduct. And so I think they're looking at, uh, there's an opportune time for all things to happen. This is uh, their moment, whether or not the ETF proposals actually get approved or continue to get rejected. You know, we'll see. We know the arguments on both sides, uh, but I do think um, the the notion that we have as an industry weathered the worst of the the bad acts could another shoe drop? Absolutely. But I think we've bled out of the system some of the excess, some of the excess funding and the bravado um, and the over promise under delivery. Uh, that existed, the lack of architecture, the, the lack of connectivity, the lack of, of certainty, and the lack of simplicity. And I think what we're now going to see are individuals and organizations that are very used to dealing with the regu regulated footprint coming in to find their niche, their piece. The one unique thing, and I think you know, Jess and, and Sonia really hammered home on this point, this is different. This still, unlike traditional financial products, this is not institutional or it's not purely institutional, right? At its heart, crypto was retail. It was the way for two people to send value across a network without an intermediary. No banks, no financial institutions, no BlackRock, no regulators, no lawyers. And I think no uh, lawyers. That, Wait a minute now. Yeah, no lawyers, that's crazy. I think I could get disbarred for even even saying that. Um, for sure. But I think I think what what we're um, you know beginning to to understand is that there is an opportunity for the 
financialization of crypto and the uh, TradFi application uh, to crypto. Uh, will it uh, destroy the hearts and minds of some of the crypto bros? Probably. I think it breaks the back of some of those who believe that it is purely a person-to-person -person peer network that doesn't involve any other regulatory footprint. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's gone. And I think what you now see is the maturation of something that is itself a, a rather novel financial instrument and a rather novel technology that's being deployed because it makes sense now to deploy it to institutions who see value through its speed, efficiency, especially compared, you know, to the legacy systems that banks uh, are, are still running. It's probably one of the biggest costs that financial systems and depositors are bearing is the cost of maintaining this huge architecture that exists there. What, COBOL-based banking systems aren't <laughs> optimized for the future of finance, David? Sonia, Jess, I wanted to turn a bit of that question over to you both um, because I think you both have different perspectives on it. But what do you both make of TradFi's kind of progressively becoming more involved in crypto? And, and where might the principles align with some of the things that they do. Jess, do you wanna, do you have any thoughts about that? Sure, um, I mean, I think on, um, a general, on a general level, it's great. I think, you know, the, the crypto industry wants, you know, everyone to participate. It's not, you know, necessarily, um, you know, just a retail market. On the other hand, as sort of an early-ish adopter in the space, you know, I, you know, I value it for sort of what it provides or provided rather to retail customers. And I think that, you know, there is some, you know, the more the more institutional focus, you know, you have the more legit, the more the more legitimate, I think, that the industry sort of becomes in, in sort of on a on a global scale. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that the downside is sort of, is more or less that it is sort of, you know, this market and opportunity and the space for retail participants to thrive. So I think it's sort of reaching a balance where, you know, um, traditional um, traditional players in, in sort of the financial um, industry in sort of traditional financial industries um, can play nicely, I guess, with retail customers would be ideal. So thank you, Jess. Sonia, you, you've seen, you've interacted with some of the biggest organizations in financial markets. And, and I give you the same question. And I might be misremembering this, but I remember a conversation you and I had years ago uh, about crypto. And I think one of us had the opinion over lunch that, well, institutions probably won't be interested in this. Uh, I could be misremembering. I might have had, you know, too much coffee that day. <laughs> And we're seeing a very different world now. In the institutions that you know, what's their perspective on what's happening in this space? And again, you know, given an eye to principles, why are these principles important in that, in that dialogue? So, <laughs> yeah, this, I remember we had this lunch, and this was like many, many, many years ago. Um, I was less gray. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to actually add to this, the whole, actually to what David said earlier about BlackRock. And this is, this is a, uh, a real life example that I'm giving, and I'm not going to mention the person's name. I had a investor from Blackstone, and she actually came to me and she said, "You know what? Blackstone is not investing in crypto. I want to put X amount of money and pretty sizable amount of money into crypto." And I was, and she's one of the key investors there. Okay, I mean she's a, she's sitting in Puerto Rico, so you know why she's yeah. sitting in Puerto Rico for God's sake to save taxes essentially, right? And she said. And she asked me how I could force Blackstone into getting into crypto. And this was like a few years ago. Okay. So you, you see that the, the pressure on their funds has come from their investors directly, right? Mm -hmm. They're seeing the returns the retail market is getting out of it. So they, I mean, the, the, the backlogs of the world had no choice. I mean, they have to, and I think they're going to influence the regulation because their investors are going to force them. I mean, it's very similar to, to David and what we experienced on Dodd Frank, I mean, nobody wanted to adopt that, and nobody wanted to, you know, have transparency around them. It's nobody had wanted to have transparency around reporting, and BlackRock came and reinforced it because they didn't know how to play in the market otherwise. The investors were saying, "What's happening to my portfolio?" So I think the investors, when they see the retail return, they are going to say, "Hey, why can't we get those X hundred X or X amount? Sure. Why can't you diversify your assets?" I mean, audit investment managers are now attending. So here's another example. The, you know, the consensus I went to 
the first consensus I went to, there was only kids around there. Okay. And now you have institutional, you have Bank of New York, CIO sitting in one corner or a government's here, but they don't see it. They're all sitting there. Okay. Yep. So what does that tell you? I mean, that the institutions have to get in. Even with the viral markets, when I was speaking at a few years ago, they were sitting on quietly. They wanted to listen what's happening. Yep. So there is a, they, they realize that they have no choice. They, they fought it initially for, for a valid reason because they didn't want to use lose their retail banking share, which is pretty standard. They didn't want mm-hmm. to lose their, uh, the payments business that they have lost to the PayPal's when most of the world in some ways. Uh, and, and, and they, I think, realize that it's here to stay. Yeah. So you know, you, you, I, it's here to stay, guys. I mean, they, they just have to adjust to it. Go ahead, David. Sorry, David. Go ahead, David. No, no, I apologize. I didn't mean to cut you off, Sonia. Um, you know, one one thing that is abundantly clear is that you know there there is a reason why we're seeing the demand for the the applications for all of the ETFs. There's a bit of a political dynamic at work there, but clearly, there's also a recognition that the pure crypto owning and holding crypto is hard. You either do it yourself, and you have a cold wallet for security reasons. And then you have the risk of what if you lose your, your wallet, right? It, th- there's an imperfection in the way in which a retail, uh, just an individual, if I wanted to own crypto, I wanted to have it, uh, you know, Ledger X or some other device to store it in. What happens if there's a fire in my house? What if it's stolen? What if I, I lose it? On the other side, I go to Coinbase or I go to someplace else and I have to worry about their financial stability, their safekeeping, their code of conduct. And I don't know what's regulated, what's not. And so the ETF universe is the way in which the financial community gets to solve that problem. Yep. It, David, con- it converts it to a security. David, thanks so much. Shout out to our dear friend uh, and colleague, David Brill, who chairs our crypto asset working group. He and I have had this conversation about the user experience, even for cold storage, David many times and there's still a lot of work that has to happen there. For the audience, let me pause for a moment. If you've got questions, please enter them in the chat. Again, if you're looking for copies of uh, the crypto industry principles that the WSBA has put forward, www.wsba.co. And this is an open public call. We're working with industry participants, both inside and outside of the Wall Street Box Channel Alliance. If you're in the audience and you're interested in joining us for our next meeting as we begin to move forward on releasing, uh, on putting forward release 2.0, Info at wsba.co. Drop us a note. It'd be happy. It would be great to have you uh, be part of the conversation and be part of the work that's happening here. Sonia, Jess, David, I want to also re- reframe the conversations about the principles because we alluded to it to in, the, in the beginning. And a lot of the um, the air in the room, I suspect, has been about crypto for the most part. When we talk about FTX, when we talk about all this stuff. But as we evolve these principles and they evolve throughout the ecosystem of participants, we're not just talking about crypto, right? We're talking about, we are talking about tokenization. We're talking about NFTs. We'll have to address DeFi in some way. We'll have to talk about the engagement of blockchain and smart contracts across different industry verticals. Uh, David, if I could, I want to start with you. How do generic principles easily fit into such a wide range of different industries that would be impacted by this. Do you see that as an overlay that's going to take time? Thanks, Ron. Uh, Thanks for the easy question you wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to palm this off onto somebody else, but l- let, me, let me take a, a stab at it. Um, so principles are foundational. They, they remain. and but, but what will change is how they're applied to new facts, new applications, new circumstances. Acting in good faith doesn't change, right? Mm. That's foundational. Um, Full and fair disclosure so that participants in an industry understand what they are doing, what the costs are, what the risks are. Disclosure is is a a big item that can span any conduct. Um, To the extent that the conduct is, you know, institutional, maybe there's a different footprint. Maybe there's a different sense of big boys, big girls know how to protect themselves. They will do what's right. They have lawyers, accountants, investigators. They will figure out what they want to do and they can do the diligence that they need. Retail doesn't have that um, benefit. So there's always an information asymmetry 
when institutions deal with retail. And so it's in that space, regardless of the application, whether or not it's NFTs uh, in, in selling artwork online or, or music, uh, dis distributing music royalties among fans, or you know, discovering how to use tokenization to enhance and increase the liquidity of illiquid assets, whether it's real estate or IP. All of those, whenever you touch the retail button, will have the uh, the, the principles will come to the fore um, because it, it it should it should be the kind of conduct as as Jess alluded to, where consumer advocacy rules con consumer rules should apply, and there should be good conduct that in individuals who participate in that industry adopt. Uh, before there's a lawsuit, before there's a strike suit, you all, we all know that one of the ways in which industries get regulated are by you know lawsuits from uh, plaintiffs' lawyers who you know find an aggrieved party and then try to have a class action complaint uh, raised and survive motions to dismiss. That's part of the way in which the conduct gets regulated. We are looking to use the principles to avoid that uh, uh, lawsuit solution to bad conduct. We want mm. to see participants in the industry come to the table with a clearer set of understanding of what good conduct means from the get-go. David, thanks. Sonia, I want to pivot to you, and I'm going to softball a question right back to Metaverse that I think you might be looking forward to. But when we talk about not just crypto, you spend a lot of time looking at the cutting edge of innovation as it impacts markets, particularly financial markets. But, you know, I only joke about metaverse. How do you see the principles playing into what arguably might be a, you know, dynamic shift in how we just engage with each other? Thinking metaverse, for example, do, do, you know, in your mind, those principles still apply, yes? So going back to my uh, same, um, the, the example I gave about the building, right? Mm -hmm. I look at these principles as the foundation. And like I said, you know, the, the basement is the custody services. And there'll be different floors that will be coming in. There's trade fi, there's DeFi, there's tokenization, and the floors will keep building on. And I look at the rooftop as the metaverse, where we'll be dancing in the rain, the artificial rain that's created <laughs> probably by metaverse. And, you know, you'll probably have some AI tools telling you what to do in, in that space. And there'll be some artificial intelligence bots all over the place, which will kind of influence uh, in terms of how you would, you play in the, you know, different layers or different floors of the building. So in, you know, which mm -hmm. floor do you want to actually work in? Like, you know, you go to any Wall Street bank, you have, you know, you know, equity division is on third floor in Citibank, for example, the fifth floor is a fixed income floor. I think I kind of look at it that way going forward. I mean, that's my analogy of looking at it. And, and the rooftop is where you have the party, so <laughs> which is which Sonia, is where you get I, drunk. <laughs> I've got to assume you've got the meta mask, the meta, not the meta mask, the, the meta the, okay. VR outfit for your birthday coming oh, to I you. Do. I do. I, I do play with it, and um, it's 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 important. I mean, like the, you have to not you have to kind of remember that you're dealing with the Generation Z out here, right? I mean, they want. Uh, you know, they want those kind of experiences. They want that, you know, they want to evolve in a market, which is you not know, the traditional, you know, going to a bank and, you know, getting your, uh, you know, putting the ATM card and then you get your money. They don't want that. I mean, the kids don't even want to buy properties today. I mean, they want to stay in, you know, I have my friend's kids, they don't want to buy houses, you know, which is very strange, right? I mean, 30 year old kids, they don't want to buy houses. They're like, no, we're going to, Stay in Airbnb, or we're going to go in a tokenized real estate model where they can stay in a you know apartment in San Francisco in a studio in New York. They they switch because you can work from anywhere today. So yeah. guys, the way of working has changed. The way people live has changed. Uh, so I think these principles will be very helpful in laying the foundation, and hopefully it's uh, you'll help us build a robust one so the other the, the other floors can come in. David, so. how old did Sonia just make us feel by saying 30-year-old kids? <laughs> yeah, I feel like I should hang it up. I'm done. <laughs> Jess, you, you know, you you come from a younger generation, so let's just throw that out there. You know, and we've joked about it, but in truth, you know, my niece is, I don't think, my niece has never set foot in the bank, but she knows how <laughs> to engage in crypto. She knows how to get engaged in the metaverse. How do you see, Jess, the generational change and why 
are principles that we're trying to put forward for the industry universal across generations? Oof. Um, Another easy question. <laughs> I mean, as part as a member of the younger um, generation, <laughs> it's difficult um, without without hating on on your generation <laughs> or, or my generation. <laughs> I just, this is going south fast. Go ahead, continue, please. <laughs> uh, <laughs> How do I how do I see the younger generation? Well, I mean, your you, uh, younger generations are still looking for an industry and participation across industries and th that operate in a principled way. No one wants to operate in an illicit industry with a chance of them having a rug pull that takes away their tokens is, you know, 90 percent. So in my mind, when we talk about principles, they are, they are meant to be universal, multi-generational principles. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, th I think without a doubt, it, it applies for everyone. And I think that the, as you mentioned, the entire industry and every, uh, you know, every market participant wants, you know, this sort of standards and regardless of what, uh, whether we're you know, going to get them from a legal perspective or otherwise. Yeah. I, I want to throw out one last question. We've only got a few moments left. One of the things we very much focus on, and David, you and I have had this conversation as well. Um, we may not be lobbyists, as you all know, and for everyone in the audience, please know we're not lobbyists, but We've got the privilege of working with uh, and, and speaking to, from an educational perspective, lots of regulators, lots of legislators. And I think one of the things that's very interesting, a, a, a someone I know very well, uh, um, an industry colleague had said, the pace of innovation will never be as slow as it is today. Um, <laughs> and, and our argument is that things like the WSBA crypto industry principles are meant to address that in the sense that if innovation, if law and regulation can't keep up with the pace of innovation, at least fundamental principles of behavior, let's call it, in the ecosystem are universally able to be applied. Do you agree with that statement? Is innovation moving so fast, David, that it's making the regulators and legislators job, jobs harder? And do our crypto industry principles make that easier for them? You know, I think it, it, it's the fundamental problem of regulation. Mm. And I don't think we know the right approach there there's different variations between europe and the uk uk and the us you know just take a look at the way regulation works in in england it's more principle it, it is more principles based their their financial conduct rule book is is not thousands and thousands of pages it's principles and there are case law and there are there is a regulatory overlay, but again, it is not the multi-jurisdictional regulatory agency that we have here. The U.S. takes a, a view where, you know, death by a thousand cuts, right? We'll give, we'll give you a thousand rules, a, a thousand things you should not do and a thousand things you must do. And that's also regulation, you know. And so I think what we're, you know, when we say that technology is moving too quickly uh, in in crypto and in uh, technology writ large, whether or not it's AI or blockchain. I think what we're, we're grappling with is the notion of what is the most efficient way to regulate new forms of conduct in a principles-based regime. Mm. And rather than continue to um, promote regulation on issue-by-issue, uh, -issue, industry by industry, act-by-act, -act, consumer versus uh, institutional, um, and whether or not it's financial versus commercial, and whether or not it's advertising or online or digital, I think if you have principle-based regulations, if you have core principles and beliefs that are sacrosanct, it becomes a little bit easier to organize oversight and then apply principles to conduct as you'd see it being evinced in the market. It's a little bit of a trade-off, right? The certainty that you have from explicit rules, you know, it means that you know with absolute certainty which side of the line you, you are on. When you have principal regulation, you have less certainty, but more flexibility and freedom of movement, and hopefully some ability for both regulated and regulators to act in good faith with each other to find where the balance needs to be struck in each new development as we, we layer it in it. David, thanks so much. I, we've only got a couple of minutes. I want to uh, kind of quickly wrap it up with closing comments, but briefly, again, to the audience, thank you for joining us. If you're interested in joining meetings within the WSBA and beyond, 
uh, with the ecosystem of all of us working to derive these principles, drop us an email, info at wsba.co. It'd be great to have you. We're also working with other trade associations uh, and other organizational bodies as well. Sonia, um, do you have any closing comments? Then we'll go to Jess and David as well. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about our next episode next week. But Sonia, what are your closing thoughts? Uh, so I think after the principles that we've put together is actually a, helping create the bridge between traditional finance and digital finance. Uh, and in, in some ways, it's laying a, a strong foundation, but a simple foundation. And we're trying to help the regulators to look at it very simply and, and to prevent regulatory arbitrage here. Because as we know, you know, a lot of stuff is moving offshore and uh, we don't want the same thing as happening in the derivatives world where, you know, because... You know, it happened then, then back then too. I mean, you were hedging. I mean, the, the funds were hedging across to the UK and Canada and others, uh, especially people who hadn't taken TARP at that time. So you don't want to, because of the lack, you know, the speed of innovation, you don't want to lose out and, you know, uh, you want to keep up and want to keep it simple. So that's my message. That would be my message. And, you know, that please keep it simple. It, it helps. It's a management principle too. And that's what I think we are following out here. So mm -hmm. hopefully that resonates with everybody. Sonia, thanks so much. Jess, any closing comments on your end? Um, sure. Thanks, Ron. Um, and thank you for, for doing this and for having me. And thank you, David and Sonia, for <laughs> sharing this honor. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah, I just I just want to sort of encourage everyone to take a look at, at the uh, our crypto industry principles. We're pretty proud of, of our, our work product and sort of we encourage you to be part of the conversation and, and you know, participate in, in this discussion and in future discussions and, you know, put your feedback in and, and, and help us make this the best it could be. Jess, thanks so much. David, any closing comments from you before we wrap? Sure. So. Um... I am an optimist as I get older. I think I was more critical and hypersensitive when, you, when I was younger. I look at the younger generation. I think they're problem solvers. I don't think that we did such a great job getting to this point. So point. to the extent that we have engineers and uh, computer scientists and builders and developers figuring out a way to solve the problem on the ground for individuals trying to figure out how to avoid inflation in the country. If you have 100%, 1,000% inflation, holding local currency is the kiss of death. Crypto was intended to resolve some of that. Mm -hmm. um, could it have done better? Maybe. But I, I'm an eternal optimist. And I think that regulators and the industry, they may not get everything right, but they will get it right enough. And that's where I think we need to end. David, Jess, Sonia, thanks so much. Thank you for being so patient while, while I tore up the script of all of our prep and stuff like <laughs> that, that we didn't even begin to talk about. But that's a wrap on episode one of Understanding the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance's Crypto Industry Principles. Episode two next week. Jess, you don't know it yet, but you and I are deep diving into customer rights uh, as we peel back the layers of why that's important across the principles. So Again, further information, info at wsba.co, and we hope you join us next week. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us.